Welcome to the City Current Radio Show. I'm Andrew Bartolotta, Director of Digital Media here at City Current. And today we're talking about a museum whose rich history in Memphis continues now under a new name, the Memphis Museum of Science and History, MOSH for short. And joining us to talk about the museum is their executive director, Kevin Thompson. Kevin, thanks for joining us today. Thanks, Andrew. Now give us a history of the Memphis Museum of Science and History and talk about the recent rebrand from the Pink Palace Museum. I think everybody knows the story. And Clarence Saunders uh, gave the mansion to the city back around 1926. In 1930, it became a museum and it was the Museum of Natural History and Industrial Arts or a big mouthful. So we didn't go that direction with the name, <laughs> uh, but we did really see an opportunity during COVID to really reawaken the museum and just bring something fresh to the city. And that's what we're trying to do. We, we really saw a need to unite all our properties together. I can't tell you how many times I talk to folks locally and they really don't realize the connection among all our properties and they think they're all separate. And so um, as we grow into a regionally focused museum, uh, we wanted to make sure all our properties are housed under that same umbrella and that we could market that uh, on a more regional basis and get, you know, the out of town visitor in, uh, certainly want local folks to come. And, you know, it is the Pink Palace. It's the mansion. It's not going to change. It's not going to move. Neither is Lichterman Nature Center. I mean, that's how we know these places. So um, we're keeping those around. And, uh, but we did, we really saw a need to just freshen things up, show we're going in a different direction over here and really, you know, Sort of put the stake in the ground and say hey um, come engage with us as we move forward yeah and i think that it gives you an opportunity to sort of expand among the sort of stem projects and um exhibits that you have at the museum one of the things that um we were talking about off camera was uh, that i love is that it's a living breathing museum and it's not just a look at the past but it's also a viewfinder into the future and one of those um exhibits or you know part of the museum that you have is the curiosity lab which is an interactive space for guests and so talk about what's happening there in the curiosity lab and the steam weekends that you're having over the summer sure, sure. we are doing steam uh over the summer so maybe you know we didn't just rebrand externally we did a lot of in-house work uh, as well so every week we have a group that is a content development team that we meet and we plan out what we're going to be doing from a programming standpoint, um, at least nine months out, six to nine months out. So these things are in development in house behind the scenes and we're trying to improve our quality and we're trying to make sure that it's connected among our properties. And so right now STEAM is our, our theme, if you will, um, that we are uh, programming around. Um, it started with our exhibit from the Field Museum, the Biomechanics, which is a great high quality exhibit. Um, that will be here through August 1st. Um, that exhibit talks about how animals work, basically, and then it goes into the industry and how scientists use the normal mechanics of a human being or an animal to develop products for us that we use every day. Um, with that, we are having Lichterman Nature Center come into the Curiosity Lab. So the Curiosity Lab is uh, just to the left of the stairs going down to the large screen theater. And uh, every weekend from one to four, uh, we bring animals in uh, from Lichterman Nature Center to connect to uh, biomechanics exhibit. And so that will be going on during the run of that exhibit. Um, with this fall in October, the state has a statewide uh, two week STEAM focus and they talk about things all over the state. So the second weekend of that, I don't have the date in front of me, I think it's around the 20 something of October, uh, but we're gonna do a STEAM festival here working with uh, corporate, uh, uh, different corporations to really, again, engage with um, just helping kids and adults alike know how important it is to learn about science, learn about technology. Um, you know, you can almost think of it as career development in a way, but not in a job fair sense, more in a hands-on activity. This is why, I mean, these companies use this technology. This, these companies use math, um, you know, engineering. Uh, so to demonstrate how it's used so that, you know, kids, adults, teenagers, all can see how important it is um, as part of their growth and, and their education. 
in addition to the exhibits, you also have this really cool giant screen theater that um, kids from all around and adults alike love to come and watch. And, and you have everything from underwater adventures to learning about Cuba and dinosaurs. Talk about the giant screen theater, um, how people can, can come and, and, and watch some of those, uh, those movies offerings. We've had some great movies. Uh, Cuba is phenomenal. I've seen it twice. Um, just the scenery in it, it goes through the story of a historian and a ballerina and uh, an underwater uh, marine biologist and kind of connects them. So it really brings a lot of personality to, um, you know, to the country. And the scenery is gorgeous, especially on the water screen. Um, uh, the other movie that's uh, opening is Sea Lions, and it's about a group of sea lions and pups uh, from Australia. And so it's a cute movie. I've only seen the trailer, um, but I think that's going to be a big blockbuster this summer as well. And of course, we have the dinosaur movie that rotates out um, uh, as well, because everybody's got to have a dinosaur. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. You've got to, if you're a museum, you've got to have dinosaurs. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> now, in addition to the museum, um, located at the Peak Palace Mansion. You also run the Lichterman Nature Center, Coon Creek Science Center, along with two historic homes. And you were talking about on the onset about having that brand under one umbrella. Talk about these organizations and what people can do or learn there. You know, you think of us as really distinct organizations, um, but we are working very hard, like I said, to bring programming and cross program. Um, and, and years ago that was done. Uh, when Doug Noble was the director here, um, you would often find someone from Lichterman with an animal out front. So we're hoping to do little things like that as we uh, come, you know, bring the museum back to the city. Um, it's, we've had some great fun things out at Lichterman uh, during COVID. They've been smaller events, um, nature walks or bird walks. Um, they're early morning and groups of 10. And we just, we just ended those. So sorry, but <laughs> we, we probably will bring them back. They were sellouts um, and we kept them small. That way you could see birds and you could see the animals out there. Um, that was intentional. And they were done early morning um, when the animals were out. We also did a nature by firelight. We've done it twice now and we're planning to do it again in uh, November, I think on the 5th. Um, it's a evening event and you get to go on the trails uh, while you were out there and we have different stations. And then, you know, we had s'mores one time um, and just a good family fun event, a good date night, actually. We had a lot of adults there doing dates. Um, uh, young and old or groups of, of folks coming through. And I think the very first one, we had some Cub Scouts even come as a, as a larger group. And it's, it's enough space. You can have your quiet adult area and you can have your kid area separate over here. And um, it just makes for a really, really nice evening. Before being named executive director last year, you've been a board member for the past seven years and then an officer for three of those. So um, the Memphis Museum of Science and History is uh, is not new to you at all. Talk about your longstanding work with the development of the museum's strategic plan and what's been the most exciting progress you've seen over the past almost decade with the museum. Sure, um, and actually I'm an officer for four of the seven years. Uh, <laughs> I was the first two-term president. Uh, Joy Bowen was ahead of me and, and we really saw a need to change kind of how the structure work from the officer standpoint as we move forward. Um, you know, we did a lot of work. So the MOSH and the things going on here come from a lot of work that the board and some senior staff did uh, with a strategic consulting firm. Uh, Mark Columbo at FedEx uh, was very helpful to bring in uh, IA Collaborative out of Chicago. And we did a lot of research. Uh, we felt the museum, we felt people in the city wanted to engage with the museum, but we weren't doing the right thing to get them to engage. And so we asked IAC to kind of come in and test that for us. And, and they did, and they did a tremendous job. Um, they actually, we didn't do the charrettes and listening tours. Um, they actually embedded people, about five or six people in the city in different neighborhoods, living in Airbnbs for 90 days and got to know the neighborhood, got to know Memphis. That's, that was really cool. We gained a lot of intelligence that way. Um, they also interviewed all kinds of stakeholders from tourists to city leaders to folks who lead different groups. And again, we gained a lot of 
things from that that gave us the information we needed to learn how to uh, engage better with the city. So we're beginning to work on some of those. I call it a um, almost like a guidebook that they left us with, um, but it wasn't a strategic plan. So now we're developed a five-year operating plan um, that the board's going, hopefully will approve soon, <laughs> but it's in process just wrapping up and it's been through the board committee already. And, and what we're gonna do with that is it's really gonna say what parts of that plan we're gonna implement and what's gonna have to wait till later. Cause obviously there was a lot in there and we can't do it all at once, but for my chair, I, I really see an opportunity. You know, we engage, like I've been talking about programming, we engage and connect through programming. I mean, yes, our main exhibit hall was last renovated in 1984, I believe. So we want to freshen that up and we want to do something different there, but that's going to take us five to seven years at least. So we're working on that now. We're going to do it the right way and we're going to do it slow and steady. I don't need that to engage with the public though. I need programming. I need to tell you what's going on. I need to get you in here, um, whether it's here or Lichterman or downtown, I wanna find a way to connect with you and really to connect with everyone in the city. What are some lessons you and your team learned throughout the pandemic? And maybe some of those lessons that you're now taking forward as we try to look to a somewhat end of, of this uh, COVID state of operating. You know, it really gave us an opportunity to restructure internally and to break down the silos. So, you know, I've talked about the properties being separate. They really operated separately. And even within the properties, different departments would operate separately. So um, we broke that down right away. And the content development team includes historical properties, includes Electorman, includes the Pink Palace. And so um, with that, it gave us a much sharper focus um, you know, one we're still working to hone in on and improve, um, but it really gave us the opportunity to think through our programming more thoroughly, what we're doing, why we're doing it, who we're doing it for, and, um, you know, get our focus back a little bit. And, you know, we had to do it leaner and meaner. And of course we did all the video stuff. I, I didn't want to over bet on the video, um, you know, we certainly have virtual field trips for teachers. Um, um, we did some, some events through video and it all went as well as it could, but I think long-term people want to connect in person. And so I, you know, I got the camera equipment I needed, but I didn't go and do the whole full-blown studio or things like that. I, we're, we did make some improvements in some old school stuff, but certainly with our education department, um, we have suitcases, we call them, that teachers can check out. And they're these big military grade boxes uh, full of basically a lesson plan that the teacher gets for a two week period. And all they have to do is call us and check, us, check it out. Um, if they're Shelby County, it's free. If they're out of town, it's a nominal charge basically. Um, and what we did with that program, that program pretty much stays fully booked. So during COVID, we were able to get a grant to increase it 50%. So we're hopeful. I don't know if they'll check that many out, but we're hopeful we'll see a pretty significant increase there. And again, that's a, just an example of taking a program that we're doing well, but making an investment to grow it without switching full blown into the technology side, because kids need that tactile um, uh, learning. Yeah, yeah. And what I think that y'all are doing a great job of is the hands on learning Yes. Um, through those different the different programming, so that's great. How can the community get involved, whether through volunteerism, purchasing passes, you know, visiting, obviously, sponsorships? How can the community get involved? All of those. Come number one, <laughs> show up, uh, <laughs> join us, find an event. Uh, we have so many things coming up event wise. Um, we're bringing back uh, telescopes to the lawn. That's going to be June thirtieth. Um, so we're planning for that. We did something with the conjunction and it was cloudy I, it, that night, um, you know, when the Saturn and Jupiter were aligned, completely cloudy, couldn't see anything. We still had 150 people show up that evening. And so we did a little program in the planetarium and we had the telescopes out there. So again, just things like that. We want to reconnect. Um, come see our exhibits. Uh, not only do we have biomechanics, we have... Um, through darkness, from darkness through light, uh, which is about the Underground Railroad. Uh, that's a great exhibit. It's a photographic journey. Um, and it really does start out dark and then comes to light as uh, you move up to Canada. And uh, um, we have 
New things that we've added here at the museum on a regular basis are uh, what we call make and takes every weekend. So they're little carts with activities. And we just started docent led tours. So it's an add on, you buy your exhibit ticket, and I think it's about an extra 10 bucks. And you have a person walk you through and talk about some of the artifacts and, and what they mean. And that right now has a STEAM focus as well. So um, kind of continuing with that theme for the next couple of months. Um, and then the Curiosity Lab we talked about, that's a new ad and something we plan to grow and keep. We're still honestly trying to figure out the best way to do that, um, uh, but it is something we wanna make a, a further investment in as we go forward. Yeah. So, and I'm, I didn't get to volunteers and <laughs> sponsorships. Uh, I'm looking for a development director right now. I've got interviews this week. So some of the sponsor stuff will, will change as we move forward. Um, and then our volunteer program, Certainly love to have volunteers. Um, it's a great opportunity, whether you like doing stuff outside or you like doing stuff inside, we've got a spot there. Um, we are working to give that program a little more structure, but that's gonna take a year or so before we get fully where we want. I love it. What puts a smile on your face when you look at the impact you're able to um, bring to Memphians and regional visitors alike uh, who are inspired by what they see at MOSH? I, you know, for me, it, it's seen the adults come back to the museum and the diversity. We've seen an increase in diversity. And I don't have any stats or anything, but I just see more Memphians reconnecting with us as adults. Um, and that's what we want. That's, that's where we're headed. Um, because you can just walk through and you see somebody looking at something or engaging with something and you know when the light bulb goes off. And so that you don't have to be a kid. You know, You can be an adult and do that. Certainly the kids are a lot of fun uh, and we missed them with COVID and not having the field trips. Um, um, we really wanna see those come back next year and we hope they will um, and, and that'll be a blast. But for me, I, just, I like to see both. I like to see a very well-rounded museum. You, you go to, and we were talking about this offline, you know, you go to Chicago and you've got the field museum or science and industry and you do it as an adult. You don't really do it just to take your kid or on a field trip and not come back, you know? So we're working hard to reconnect, wake in the museum and get people to come back. Where can people go to learn more about the Memphis Museum of Science and History? Our website, memphismuseums.org. Um, we also have a museum to go section that we did during COVID. It's got a lot of history. Um, and then certainly join us on Instagram or Facebook. We put all our events on Facebook. Um, so it's a good calendar if you use that. And Instagram, uh, we talk about what's going on. We also do these little snippets on different artifacts that we have. So it's a great place to learn more about Memphis history. Kevin, thank you so much for coming on the City Current Radio Show. We appreciate it. All right, Andrew, thank you.